The reason I came to Los Alamos uh, actually goes back to about 1930. At that time, I was a graduate student in physics, University of California, and my boss, Professor Leonard Lubb, uh, suggested that I join the Naval Reserve as an engineering officer. I had always been interested in machinery and big steam machinery, so I thought that was a good idea, and I did. And from that to rather casual decision back, as I say, about 1929 or 30, eventually followed a train of events which uh, got me to Los Alamos. I got my degree in physics, uh, went to teach physics at Stanford University, and then when the war came on, or shortly before, I found this old Naval Reserve Commission uh, coming back to call me up. Having been in the Naval Reserve for 10 years then, I couldn't see any good reason for not going on with the problem. So I said, yes, I'm ready. When do I go and where do I go? And I was assigned as an ordnance search officer to the um, Naval Proving Man at Dalgan, Virginia, where, believe it or not, there was my old friend uh, Leonard Lutt. I spent the first three years of the war there until 1944. And in the course of that, I worked for a man by the name of Deke Parsons, then Captain Parsons. And one day in the spring of 44, I think it was, or thereabouts, he sort of disappeared from the proving ground and uh, nobody would say where he went. Uh, there were rumors of some project uh, that a lot of fizz were working on somewhere, but no one knew much about it. In fact, no one knew anything about it. And uh, there was some speculation that perhaps Admiral Parsons, that Captain Parsons had, uh, had joined that project. But a little later in the spring, early summer, I was taking my first leave of my family out in California when I got a frantic telegram from Bureau of Naval Personnel which uh, said, your leave is canceled. Uh, report to Albuquerque, New Mexico, where you will be met. At Albuquerque, I was met by my old friend, Edward Parsons. And by and we started out the 100-mile drive to, to Los Alamos, and at that time, I got the first clue as to what was, what was going on here. It was a very pleasant trip. It uh, reminded me of my home in California, nice, beautiful desert country, and uh, I'd seen about all I wanted to of the green fields and hills of Virginia. And so when Parsons said that he wanted me to come here, be assigned here, and uh, help George Kistiakowsky in the operation of what was then called the Explosives Division. Uh, I was in no position to argue much anyway, and except for a slight fleeting thought that crossed my mind more than once, once I got there, I'd never get away. Uh, in about a month, uh, I'd packed up my affairs at, at Dahlgren, and uh, driven across the country, my family, and turned up uh, at what was then somewhat, sometimes sort of the concentration camp, uh, a place called Project Y. It was Los Alamos, but all that anybody knew was Project Y. The first impressions of the place were a little extraordinary. There were a series of old green buildings made of fiberboard, two-story high, lining a narrow road, surrounded by a fence. In the general vicinity of these buildings were barracks, uh, some little prefab sort of huts that had been brought down from Hanford, and a considerable number of uh, rather bleak but very efficient four-family apartments. And in addition to that housing, there was a place called Bathtub Row. Bathtub Row was all that was left at that point, almost all that was left, of the days of Los Alamos Ranch School, because up until 1942, Los Alamos had been the site of a boys' school. There was the big 
big house, which was one of the boys' dormitories, a nice stone log building, a beautiful building called uh, Fuller Lodge, and uh, three or four stone buildings that were <coughs> classrooms and housing for, for the masters, and then a big log building where uh, Parsons himself at that time lived. But it was a rather extraordinary place to come to. Uh, we worked six days a week, very busy. The uh, group of people which had been gathered here by Oppenheimer was the most extraordinary group of people. I met all the physicists I had uh, read about and read their papers for the last uh, 15 years in the flesh. There, there, there they were working. Uh, there were about as many GIs as there were civilians at work. Uh, the GIs were very uh, the stage of academic career. Some had PhDs and were sergeants. Some were the uh, two-year engineering wonders who had been snatched from their college careers and uh, given a quick course in physics or chemistry or engineering and uh, sent to work in, in technical pursuits. But the, I say the extraordinary thing about it was the, the way in which this strange group of people uh, worked together I won't say without friction, but I will say with extraordinary harmony. I mentioned that the, the laboratory worked with extraordinary unanimity, extraordinary harmony, and I think there is one man who should be given the entire credit for the way in which the, which the laboratory was able to function. A lesser man couldn't have done it, and a man, only the greatness of, of Robert Oppenheimer, it seems to me, could have really carried this out. Absolutely extraordinary man, totally dedicated to his task. He knew a great deal about everything. You could come to him on almost any subject, any subject in physics, mathematics, uh, very shortly, any subject in explosives, hydrodynamics. Oppie knew what you were talking about, had a useful comment, had a useful opinion, could make a wise decision. Always willing to listen to anyone. Believe me, among a group of military and a group of civilians and scientists, there were people that took a lot of listening too. Some because they had something important to say and some sometimes because their feelings were hurt about something. Uh, Avi navigated this difficult group of people, these this difficult problems with extraordinary skill. And uh, with practical unanimity, he was the leader. He was the boss. It was Oppie's project. Uh, later on, of course, in the hearings, about his, having to do with his clearance, uh, he was criticized by some for disloyalty. I myself, knowing him here at Los Alamos during the war years, cannot believe that there could be a man more dedicated more honest, more devoted to his country, more devoted to getting this task done, done rapidly and done well. I myself will never doubt his personal loyalty, his personal integrity, and I will never cease to regret the fact that his loyalty had to be called into question. Stearns canceled during the, those unhappy hearings. Everyone was always glad that later on, the fact this was a mistake was recognized by the country when Oppie received the Fermi Award. Life at Los Alamos during those war years was, was very exciting. It had its frustrations. Uh, one of the major frustrations was probably due to the fact that uh, the existence of Los Alamos was classified, the fact that one was at Los Alamos was classified. We didn't exist at all. Uh, for example, all incoming mail was opened and read to make sure that nothing wrong was coming into anyone. All outgoing mail was put into the post office, post office so-called, unsealed, where it was read by the censor. The censor thought it was all right, he sealed it or she sealed it, and uh, it was sent up to the normal U.S. mails. 
But the fact the mail was censored was itself classified. And so if the censor didn't like what you said, he simply sent the letter back to you and uh, left you to guess what you had done wrong. Uh, but you got used to it. And nowadays, those envelopes with the seal by the censor are philatelic curiosities and very, very rare. At the time, they were something of a, of a humorous curse. No problem, of course, those were the days of gas rationing. We had about enough gasoline per family car to make one trip to Santa Fe a month. Uh, naturally, people got together, and uh, one was able to get there perhaps twice a month. But it was forbidden, and people obeyed us, to go farther away than Santa Fe unless there was some uh, domestic uh, crisis that required one's presence some, somewhere else in which case permission had to be obtained. Santa Fe was very relaxed about the existence of this secret project on the hill. It had various uh, rumors. Uh, one that it was a submarine base uh, connected by a long tunnel to the Pacific Ocean. Also it was a home for, let's say, wayward wax. Uh, but the residents of the state of New Mexico were very much to be commended for their lack of curiosity about what was happening up here. Purely was classified, there was a fence around it, there were guard gates, had to have a pass, but uh, no, one was, no one was really very curious and no one tried to pry. It's hard to, as I say, to recapture all its, all its facets. One of the extraordinary things about it was the way in which very famous people lived together. Uh, perhaps at one time or another, more Nobel laureates came by Los Alamos than have ever come by any similar place in the course of time. Almost every physics department of any consequence in the United States, or chemistry department these days, has an alumnus, or has several alumni of Los Alamos. Lawrence was a frequent visitor here, and his enthusiasm, his energy, his absolute dedication to the project, which started at the Rad Lab in Berkeley, uh, was infectious for anyone who, who knew him. Fermi, of course, was an absolutely wonderful man. Uh, there was no subject in physics uh, which he couldn't think about and explain. Sometimes his explanations were so simple and so obvious that while one listened to them, they went down uh, very easily. You think, now I understand that perfectly. A little later on, when you try to recapture that proof or that theorem, it wasn't quite as simple as it had seemed when Ferry himself was talking about it. But actually, wonderful man, his, his guidance, his help, his ideas, his intuition was, was beyond belief. Uh, Frisch was here, famous besides for his physics, for his ability to play the piano. And Segre, the great names of, of physics uh, were here at Los Alamos, some as residents, some as visitors. Bohr himself came occasionally. And uh, all of these were very exciting to, to a young physicist and to the younger people who were here. The technical job which the laboratory had to do between the middle of 1943 and just as soon thereafter as it could possibly be accomplished, was best described as to see if an atomic bomb could be made, and if it could be made, make one. Very early in the game, after the, sort of the basic physics had been worked out at the Met Lab and a lot of university laboratories around the country, it began to look increasingly probable that there was nothing in nature that said that you couldn't make a nuclear explosion. That is to say, you couldn't release an enormous amount of nuclear energy very rapidly and uh, have an extraordinary uh, explosion of a different magnitude than any had been ever seen before. Nevertheless, one was dealing with a regime of temperature and pressure 
It had never been seen the surface of the Earth. And it was always, of course, possible that somewhere uh, there was a phenomenon or an effect which had been overlooked. There seemed to be two ways to go about getting this the nuclear explosion. Well, the most commonplace one was what we then called the gun type of assembly, where one simply brought two subcritical pieces of fish material together fast enough under suitable conditions so the explosion would result. But in the course of working on that particular method of attack and the problem, another idea turned up the laboratory that it might be possible to assemble material by explosive means in a spherical geometry. And uh, if this were the case, then there would be certain gains in, let's say, efficiency and in uh, possibly even in practicability. So both of these ways of going about the problem were under active exploration by the time I came to Los Alamos. It was the increased emphasis that Oppenheimer wished to place, and Kisti wanted to place upon the implosion type of assembly that I think was probably directly responsible for my being assigned to that, that type of activity. Nevertheless, both, both of these things were, were pursued with equal vigor, and uh, there was almost a race between the availability of the material and the availability of the necessary professional technical skills, physics skills, explosive skills, to make either one or the other type of device. Actually, this is now history, of course, these, both the task of the gun-type device and the implosion-type device were completed about the same time. And it was decided to test, to make a test uh, near Alamogordo, uh, called the Trinity site, of the implosion system. There was good reason for doing this. The, if there was anything wrong, uh, time to find out about it was now rather than heat of battle. Secondly, the uh, implosion system was the most technically complicated. Uh, if it worked, it would test two things at once. It would test this fundamental concern that I mentioned a moment ago, can you or can you not make any atomic bomb? And if it, we could, then had we made the implosion system sufficiently precise and its associated gadgetry sufficiently good that indeed we had a useful uh, nuclear weapon. As everyone knows, the test was a, a great technical success. The behavior of the device was well within the range of predictions, it was quite a large range, but to right at the upper end of those predictions. It's a frightening thing to see in a sense, uh, the, to me, the brilliance of the light which accompanied the explosion was something that one had no prior uh, experience in seeing. Uh, absolutely amazing. We were far enough away, at least I was, so the noise, the sound, the explosion, bang was not particularly unusual when we heard that before. But the brilliant and long-lasting light was something that had never before been seen. Many people have since uh, claimed to have had very deep thoughts, and I sometimes get asked, did you have any great deep thoughts about this subject at that particular instant? And I'm afraid the answer must be no, I did not. We had worked very hard for the preceding several days. Uh, many of us had worked very hard for the preceding several years. And this was a technical achievement of the highest, highest order. I think probably for most of us, uh, our thoughts were more lines with, gee whiz, it worked. And there was a sort of a, a professional triumph here uh, with little thought for what one had really done uh, in, the, in connection with the history of the world, the history of warfare. Nevertheless, those thoughts, of course, came, came very soon afterwards. 
because the question then was being faced already, if the Almogordo test is successful, uh, will the device be used at, uh, in Japan in connection with the war? And of course, having proved that nuclear explosions can take place, uh, both types of device were, were then available for, for use. And at the highest levels, it was decided that this would indeed be done. It's my own very strong opinion that this was a correct decision, although I know that many people have had, have had second thoughts about it or feelings of guilt or whatever you wish. Nevertheless, it has to be remembered, I believe, quite aside from the American lives that were probably saved by avoiding an invasion, uh, not being how sure the occasional rumors that a peace was, could be, had been negotiated. Nevertheless, I think it has to be remembered that nuclear fission uh, was known then and known before the war around the world. It was known that Hitler had considered the possibility of making an atomic bomb uh, in his country. The Russians certainly knew about it. The British knew about it. Uh, if we had not made the bomb, someone else would have. I would, for many, many reasons, prefer that this country uh, have done it. After the war came to a close, uh, Los Alamos went to a rather strange period of interregnum. A number of us believed very strongly that the things that we had not done, the avenues of research and development that had been opened up, would now have to be undertaken. Uh, that the world, having seen an atomic bomb, having known it was now possible, would certainly in several countries undertake to do it themselves. It was not possible, although attempt was made, to see if one couldn't get nuclear accord in 1945-46, but it failed. I would say, of course, because that was perhaps too much to ask of, of human nature. Perhaps the most important thing that the atomic bomb had opened up was the possibility of making a fusion bomb, because now one had on the surface of the Earth those conditions of temperature and pressure which uh, are necessary to make the fusion reaction the reaction between very light elements take place. And uh, this was simply now a, a possibility and would have to be looked at it. Uh, if we didn't, someone else certainly would. Most of our first attempts were uh, theoretical attempts uh, led us into uh, blind alleys. It didn't work or it didn't work well. And, uh, it seemed to be pretty cumbersome and effective. But uh, eventually, if smart people work at a problem long enough, and if it's within the realm of nature, they'll find the way through it. Uh, Edward Tiller and Stan Ullum, supplemented by I don't know how many coffee table discussions and laboratory discussions and experiments, came up with a way that looked feasible to make a thermonuclear explosion, to make the hydrogen bomb or the fusion bomb possible. And so we devoted them almost the entire energy of the laboratory along that particular line and were successful in the mic shot the mic shot marked both the end of an era and the beginning of a new one in the laboratory's goals and programs it was a triumphant technical success it showed that we had a long ways to go and making adaptations of thermonuclear devices for military purposes, but it also showed that we could begin to look more widely for other programs that the laboratory could conduct, which were of national need, or national interest, or of national benefit. We had various reasons for doing this. And one of the important ones was that, in contrast with almost every other field of human endeavor, which I am aware, the atomic bomb business seeks to put itself out of business. Our one objective, Los Alamos, has always been that bombs never get used. That the United States was always ahead, 
both in technology and a willingness to discuss the abandonment of nuclear warfare. Uh, and we still hope in the 50s, as we still hoped in the 60s and hope in the 70s, that someday the atomic bomb and the fusion bomb and all weapons of that sort of mass destruction will be things of the past. At the same time, we look for other areas of opportunity. Things that occur to one quickly, we can play a role in ecological studies. Some of the things we've been doing in nuclear weaponry and nuclear testing are directly applicable to the study of, of pollution. Basic research will always be necessary. Graduate education in physics, chemistry, mathematics, computers, metallurgy, you name it. This can be done at Los Alamos. And I think one of the great roles the next 10 or 20 years will be a role in graduate education, not for just one university, but for many universities. The last 25 years have been fun, mostly. There have been troubles. Uh, the budget reared its ugly head more and more in the last uh, five or 10. Uh, that's, I think, been the worst problem, but it's a real one. It's one that one has to expect. We just had it too good directly after the war. I've enjoyed my career here. It's my home. I propose to continue to live here. On the other hand, I'm glad to leave some of these problems, many of them, to my successor, Harold Agnew. Uh, he will have fun solving them as well. There's only one thing that I hope very much. The atomic bomb is now 25 years old. The countries of the world have not yet found any clear way to abolish nuclear warfare. Small steps have been made. Test ban treaties, seabed treaty, non-proliferation treaties, the current salt talks are all steps in the right direction. They're all steps which tell people that the people of the world are worried about nuclear weapons. If I had one hope, and I have it very strongly, is the next 25 years don't go by without really having accomplished the goal of the first 25, namely to abolish nuclear warfare.